Hello, my name is Eric Briggs, and I'm one of the RASC volunteers. Uh, I'm here to do a talk on the history of the Dunlap Observatory, but I think I should start by setting out some terms, because there's lots of different aspects of Dunlap Observatory history that we could talk about. I'm here to talk about the history of the DDO as it, as it pertains to the RASC, so I want to tell you a little bit about why our group is here today. There are other ways that we could talk about the history of the DDO. Uh, if Farley Mote was here today, recently passed away, he could tell us about how he explored this whole property back in the late 1930s and early 1940s. But that doesn't have anything to do with the RASC. And if we were Judy LaMarche, who was one of Canada's first female cabinet ministers, she could talk about how she studied astronomy before she transferred to law at University of Toronto. And that wouldn't have much to do with the RASC. But by and large, there is a lot of RASC history that pertains to the history of the Dunlap Observatory, and that's what I want to talk to you here about. Um, one of the common things, you can go on Wikipedia and read about history of the DDO, and that it started at a meeting of the RASC in 1921 when David Dunlap attended, and Dr. Chant, the founder of the observatory, was speaking about a comet that was flying close to the Earth. A number of people know that story. That's kind of part of the common history. But it actually goes several years further back. David Dunlap was a wealthy benefactor in the Toronto area, and he was on several boards, such as the Board of Trustees of Toronto General Hospital. And for many years, he was doing work, essentially, for Toronto General Hospital, together with the Secretary Treasurer of TGH, whose name was Alan Miller. Alan Miller had been the president of the RASC from 1918 to 1919. And here we are in 1921 talking about David Dunlap coming to a meeting of the RASC. So this connection between the hospital and Mr. Dunlap becoming involved in the foundation of the observatory is something that not a lot of people know about. And I think this should be added into the story. Dr. Chant, though, had also been the president of the RASC from 1903 to 1907. And in 1907, he started several different projects. This is a copy of the RASC Observer's Handbook, and it's been in publication continuously every year since about 1907. And it has a great deal of astronomical information in it. For example, what to do if you think you've discovered a new astronomical object. Dr. Chant also edited the journal of the RASC for 50 years uh, until his death in 1956. And for the last 20 or so of those years, the publishing house of the RASC had the mailing address right over there inside the admin building because all of the work was being done by Dr. Chant and his assistants. This book, you can find uh, certain copies of this book in the town of Richmond Hill's own library. At the time David Dunlap joined the RASC in 1921, Dr. Chant and his friends were starting to mobilize to get ready to observe a total eclipse of the sun that was seen here in Toronto on the 24th of January 1925. So David Dunlap would have been looking forward to this, but sadly he passed away less than 100 days before the sun was totally eclipsed. Still, I think that eclipse changed Toronto's astronomical future because it was seen in Toronto and also in other parts of North America. Uh, Helen Sawyer Hogg, who later became one of the key astronomers here at the DDO, was really switched on to astronomy when she observed that eclipse in 1925 on a golf course in Connecticut. And uh, most of the reports that were done in the newspapers of the time in Toronto and in other cities, well, especially in Toronto, were written by members of the RASC, people like Dr. Chant, also a man named J.R. Collins, who was writing in a newspaper that's now defunct called the Toronto Telegram. The first observing reports after the DDO was finished actually were done before the DDO was finished. In 1934, um, Peter Millman, who was one of the younger astronomers at the DDO for the first generation, uh, he wrote the Meteor Notes column in the Journal of the RASC, and he continued that all the way until 1997. Uh, the DDO was an annual observing site for the Perseid meteor shower in August, as well as the clearinghouse of meteor data gathered by amateur astronomers from across Canada. Uh, one of Peter Millman's most remarkable volunteers at the DDO observing event in 1939 
was a young man who later became a Nobel physics laureate named Arthur Shavlov. He was credited with co-discovering or co-inventing the laser. During the Second World War, the back cover of the Journal of the RASC carried the following request. Two amateur telescope makers, the wartime work in the optical industry has created an urgent need of workmen qualified to grind, finish, and test optical services. Would those amateurs in Canada who've made one or more mirrors or lenses communicate with the undersigned, giving their experience in optical work, present occupation, and qualifications? Signed, R.K. Young, Director, David Dunlap Observatory, Richmond Hill. This example shows us the DDO was trying to mobilize unqualified but experienced members of the RASC to participate in the war effort. But in peacetime, DDO's relationship with members of the RASC was meant to use science outreach to attract attention to University of Toronto. We have records of several young amateur astronomers who came to, from Toronto uh, and other cities and centers of the RASC to do summer work at the DDO who went on to do great things. Uh, for example, a, a man named Donald Morton, who actually went to my high school, Northern Secondary down in Toronto, started out by being a summer student at the DDO, later became the director of Mount Stromlo Observatory in Australia, which until recently had a telescope very similar to this one, until it was destroyed in a fire about 15 years ago. As often as not, young people interested in astronomy who participated in the RASC and visited the DDO didn't go through orthodox academia, but could still go on to do great things. James Randi visited the DDO on an RASC night in 1946. He later found fame as a magician on The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. He co-authored a book with Carl Sagan, narrating a McLaughlin planetarium show, and is very concerned, even today, because he's still alive, with debunking of pseudoscience. The role of the RASC has always started with the broad goal of public outreach education and astronomy for members of the public with pressing questions such as can we still look at the moon and see the flags that the Apollo astronauts left there? Or what happens if you fall into a black hole? And RASC speakers and DDO astronomers alike have to answer these questions. Most members of the RASC start by asking these questions and we improve our education until we can answer them. And some of us go further than that. Uh, by becoming academic astronomers or by being a little didactic. Terence Dickinson started his astronomical journey at the Dunlap Observatory in the summer of 1958 and he wrote about it in the current issue of Sky News magazine that you can find at your drugstore newsstand. Terry was one of the first presenters at the new McLaughlin Planetarium when it opened in the 1960s and he took over Helen Sawyer Hogg's newspaper astronomy column uh, he wrote 15 books about astronomy that have sold more than a million copies, and he was made a member of the Order of Canada. We have a letter, actually, that was written to Terence Dickinson in November 1969, when he was working at the planetarium, sent by a young man named Doug. Dear Mr. Dickinson, I'm currently involved in the creation of the Don Mills Astronomy Club at Don Mills Junior High School. The purpose of this club is to share astronomical information among the members to stimulate an interest in this science and also of greater importance to do active observations of the skies. He goes on, but I'll read Terence Dickinson's response. I can suggest several young men who would probably be able to speak to you. One of them is named Harold, and he gave his phone number. For the others, I have no phone number, but Her Harold could supply them. Their names are Rick and Leaf. Any of these members of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada would be a suitable speaker for your group. Good luck on your venture. Harold, Leaf, and Rick were three young members of the RASC who did several interesting observing projects here at the Dunlap Observatory in the period of 1969 and 70, such as observing the Geminid meteor shower during a blizzard and seeing the partial, partial solar eclipse in March of 1970, right from over there. Doug who was sending this message from Don Mills Junior High School, went on to win the 1978 RASC Gold Medal, given out by University of Toronto. He went to work with Tom Bolton here at the Dunlap Observatory, and he's now a professor of astrophysics at Georgia State University, and he's still a member of the RASC Toronto Centre. During the 1970s, there were several proposals for members of the RASC to participate in more than just the public outreach on the lawn that we've done since the observatory opened. The university's Department of Astronomy favored letting the RASC set up a small observatory beside the DDO. 
although it eventually came to nothing. Part of the problem was the growing effects of light pollution in Richmond Hill. Two young members of the RASC named Rob Pike and Richard Berry set up a reporting network that generated the first scientific study of the growth of light pollution in southern Ontario in 1974. It was published in the Journal of the RASC and in Sky and Telescope magazine. Richard Berry later became the editor-in-chief of Astronomy magazine between 1976 and 1992 and wrote several books. And Rob Pike has since become a distinguished engineer at Google. The DDO astronomers continued their roles in the RASC. Uh, several of the astronomers who worked here were presidents of the RASC Toronto Centre or the national RASC presidents, such as Pierre DeMarc, Don Fernie, Bob Garrison, John Hurd, William Hosick, Ruth Northcott, John Percy, Leonard Searle, and Ralph, Ralph Williamson. And uh, one of the uh, telescope operators today guiding you through the telescope dome, Heidi DeBond, came to the DDO from the RASC. Um, future MacArthur Fellowship grantee, Sarah Seeger from MIT, she actually completed her undergrad Bachelor of Science here in 1994. And when I say here, I actually mean mostly downtown, but she did visit here several times. And she is still a member of the RASC. And so several other projects have gone on in more recent years. When the university uh, left the DDO in 2007-2008, the RASC started a public observing program that we managed. We were not assisting with it. And we carried that on until 2016. Um, we also uh, participated in other community projects. More than half of the 246 letters of written to the Conservation Review Board in 2009 to support preservation of the DDO came from members of the RASC. Um, and. Uh, there was also an award given by the town to volunteers from the RASC in 2015 for their volunteer action in operating the DDO. And thank you very much.